Okay. Okay. Everyone, we're going to get started as well to our online audience. All right. Anyone else is uh, outside? Please come in, take your seats, and we're about to get started. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us on a beautiful spring day in New York City. Uh, my name is Lauren Graham. I'm the chair of Yale Blue Green, the Alumni Environment and Sustainability Shared Interest Group. I'm also Yale School of the Environment Class of 2013. And I'd like to introduce my uh, co-host for the morning. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Salim Ali. I'm uh, Yale School of Environment Class of 1996. And I'm on the board of the Alumni Association for the Yale School of Environment, as well as the board of Yale Blue Green. Uh, my day job is I'm the head of Department of Geography at the University of Delaware. And uh, I'm delighted and honored. And then, of course, uh, for our guest of honor this morning, I'd like to introduce Fred Krupp, uh, the longtime president of the Environmental Defense Fund, Yale College Class of 1975, as well as a Yale Board of Trustee member. So for today's conversation, uh, we have one hour. Uh, we're welcoming uh, our folks who are joining us online. Uh, please feel free, if you are online joining us, to go ahead and put questions in the chat. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Fred's introduction, and then we have some prepared questions, and then we'll follow that up with questions from our live audience, and then just uh, go back and forth with the time. We want to make this an interactive conversation, so uh, thank you again for being here. So Fred, uh, just to kick us off, if you could just tell us about your experience going from Yale to becoming the president of EDF and then now serving on the Yale Board of Trustees. Well, I'm happy to, Lauren, but uh, first I want to thank you for your role in founding Yale Blue Green and Salim also for your role in uh, being a big part of it and on the board of it. Um, I don't know that there's many universities who have an organization like Yale Blue Green as robust with so many events. I'm constantly getting invited to uh, great things and I, I hope we can live up to at least your average today. Uh, at the, um, I guess when I was a Yale undergraduate, um, I was doing a lot of things, but not necessarily environmental things. Until I uh, walked into a class taught by Professor uh, Charlie Walker, it was he's an engineering professor and at the time was one of the leading experts in water pollution control. And he had this uh, philosophy that environmental problems were solvable. And um, there had to be the political will, people had to stop yelling at each other, people had to get together and just there had to be a resolve to solve these problems. And that inspired me, it inspired me so much. I was on my way back to uh, meet with my friends to have my nightly dinner with them. And instead I ended up in the library uh, on cross campus uh, doing the assignment for a class that was a week away. This was a seminar that only met with 12 people around a table once a week. So, I think that really was, uh, for me, an epiphany that um, this is something that had really captured me. Um, if they're solvable, let's solve them. And one other class at Yale uh, that I think about a lot was taught by a visiting professor from Notre Dame, Father John Dunn. And it was a class in comparative religion. So what's that got to do with the story? Well, this professor, uh, uh, this father was so powerful a lecturer, he would in class transport us. We were able, at least to some extent, to transcend into the worldview of um, people with different faiths. Uh, and to me, that idea of really not only listening, but um, understanding the perspective of others somehow dovetailed with what Professor Walker had taught about needing to engage to solve problems. So from there, I, um, uh, Professor Walker said, you know, 
given your interest, Brad, I think you might consider law school. And I did some research. And at the time, the University of Michigan, um, you know, had great environmental law. And uh, I didn't quite go there on the first try, but I ended up at the University of Virginia Law School. But then I tried again for the University of Michigan because Virginia was losing its only environmental law professor. So I ended up at the University of Michigan Law School on the second try. And when I got out of law school, the governor of Connecticut had actually fired the environmental attorneys working for the Department of Environmental Protection, transferred the responsibility over to the attorney general's office. But it 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 just so concerned me that I wanted to um, go back to Connecticut and a state that I moved to for college and do something about what I considered an outrageous situation. And uh, luckily, I had a college roommate named Michael Albus who had also uh, gone to law school. And we made an agreement that I could spend half my waking hours starting this environmental thing, which became the Connecticut Fund for the Environment, more recently as merged with Save the Sound. And uh, and he and I would would start a law firm and uh, to make a living. And so for six years, I, I split my time um, doing both of those things. And then um, I, I realized, hey, the whole reason I went to law school was to do environmental things. And I was looking for a way to become more involved. But the Connecticut Fund for the Environment had a great team. And um, it wasn't, in my view, wouldn't have been appropriate for me to um, insert myself there. But luckily, the, um, when I was in law school, I had worked for the Environmental Defense Fund at NRDC as, a, as a, an intern. And uh, luckily, um, some people who had followed the fact that I had started something in Connecticut put my name in the hat, uh, um, Adam Stern, um, uh, who helped found the Connecticut Fund for the Environment with me and a bunch of other Yale students. And uh, and the rest is history. Yale, um, Yale had a lot to do with me getting to EDF, and EDF took a big chance on someone who was 30 years old to, um, you know, that somehow I, maybe the fact that I had created something from nothing was the one, one credential I had. And um, you know, since then I've had the job of my dreams and, you know, gotten to work with people way more able than I am. And it, um, it's been incredibly gratifying. Yes, Fred. So um, what an amazing journey. And you clearly played a pivotal role in growing this organization. Um, now, returning to the academia side and now with your new role as uh, a trustee, uh, what do you see as the role of academia in terms of advocacy and uh, keeping that fine line by being objective in terms of the science, but also trying to make sure that there's an agency for social change. Well, Salim, I would say that humanity is facing uh, an existential challenge and there isn't enough urgency about the fact that we are already seeing um, tremendous devastating effects, weather events, weather chaos. Uh, people, 30 million plus people were displaced from their homes in Pakistan. Um, people are losing their lives and livelihoods. I was in New Zealand uh, just um, um, six weeks ago and I couldn't get there because of a cyclone. And when I got there, I couldn't go see a, a a friend and an EDF alumni uh, named Tom Belford, because he was in the Hawks Bay area, which had um, tremendous flood. They had redesigned the whole uh, flood control system to anticipate uh, rainfall events now twice as high as had previously estimated. And this this uh, this turned out to be you know, much more devastating rainfall. So I guess my point is with the urgency, every part of society, including every university in my view, has to find its appropriate role. What is the appropriate role is really what you're asking. I, you know, when you look at EDF's work on methane over the last decade plus, 
we have cooperated with scientists, uh, more than 100 university-based scientists around the world, and they have found a way to pursue academic research consistent with their academic mission, but um, relevant to what the world needs to reduce the emissions of this tremendously powerful greenhouse gas. So I don't think universities need to take positions on, you know, bills in front of the Senate or, or endorse political candidates. But I think every university can do a lot. I'm proud to say Yale is already doing a lot. And I think Yale and every other university can do more. So following up on, on what you were saying about uh, the role of universities, that is an important factor in terms of universities being the knowledge sector, providing the research and some policy recommendations, and of course, training the next uh, generation of environmental leaders, the next <laughs> Fred Krupp. Uh, so thinking about your role- Heaven forbid. <laughs> so thinking about your role uh, on the board of trustees, how does environmental advocacy or environmental expertise factor into how you contribute to the board? Well, when, when I was asked to, uh, you know, run as part of the alumni election, um, I'm sure the, my life's work was one of the things that was considered, and I'm sure as members of the alumni body voted the fact that I have uh, expertise, some at least on climate and environmental issues was something that was considered. But I think it's important for every member of any board um, to be a fiduciary for the whole institution and tackle every issue uh, and not you know, just one issue. That being said, uh, I've been so pleased that from President Salovey to uh, Provost Scott Strobel to um, all of my colleagues on the board, they welcome the expertise that I have in, in climate and the environment. And uh, I have been asked questions and I'm engaging bringing that expertise to the table um, that I hope um, I've just started my term, but you know, in, in July, but uh, I hope over time uh, we'll make a difference. So uh, in terms of your term with the Board of Trustees, Fred, what would you, just to try to make it very specific, what would be like your key priorities that you might see um, in terms of action, um, it would be helpful if you have some particular goals, but feel free to take it whichever way you like. Yeah, the, um, you know, right now I'm in it, um, on a steep learning curve, uh, learning as much as I can about all the parts of the university. And one of the great things about the Board of Trustees is it's a fiduciary for every part of the university. Um, the medical school, the nursing school, the School of the Environment, SOM, uh, the undergraduate, uh, college and so I'm I'm soaking it all in and I think it's honestly slim too early for me to say I have specific goals but I know um, uh, the team that's managing Yale as as well as the board I, I think there's a desire that um, Yale can do more on climate so that's part of what I'm looking for what's in a, a way that um, you know, maybe there's some ideas I can bring to the table. A lot of these, um, the important things in a university, uh, most everything needs to be de decided by the people managing the university, and that's not the board of trustees. But the board of trustees has a role um, on on some issues for sure, and uh, I intend to actively play a role. And you had your retreat, I think, in Montgomery, Alabama, recently with the trustees. Are there any... Uh, experiences you might share from that with this particular meeting. Well the first uh the first board meeting back in September was um at the Equal Justice uh initiative in Montgomery and um I came away thinking every American needs to visit. Um it, the um the experience was beyond words but um both the museum and the uh, memorial there, uh, memorializing uh, 
the incredible horrors of of lynching um it um i was just so proud that um our senior fellow josh beckenstein on the yale board uh, had this idea to take the whole board there and um i would say in my in my journey and i imagine um, the journey of everyone who visits um it's just a very moving experience and i, I really encourage everyone to make a pilgrimage Thank you, Fred. So what I'm hearing is that, that there's that kind of mix of empathy and also leadership and willingness to be on the ground and really connect and, and to feel in that capacity. So I'm shifting gears a, a little bit and just curious about how you see the future of big green organizations um, like uh, UDF, for example, in the modern environmental movement and how they're connecting to smaller, more grassroots and often more diverse organizations. So what's that relationship like? Well, the relationship um, is improving, um, but um, it's been, um, you know, neither EDF uh, nor at least some of uh, our uh, sister organizations have truly incorporated equity and, and justice concerns as early as we should have. In 2019, one of our EDS trustees, uh, Peggy Shepard uh, from WE Act, encouraged me to go on a listening tour to visit frontline communities. And I began that um, just before the pandemic and I finished uh, um, other visits uh, by, by Zoom. But um, and since then, uh, just a couple months ago, we were in uh, the at the Houston Ship Canal visiting several of the groups that EDF works with. Um, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and EDF has been changing. EDF is um, when you say what's the future of EDF and other big green groups. I think we all need to incorporate. Um, the perspectives of uh, and the values of people on the front lines. And uh, I'm so proud of the work uh, EDF has been doing uh, over many years in Houston um, uh, to measure and monitor uh, and equip frontline groups with the empirical data as to how these toxic substances are wafting into their homes and schools. I visited schools in Richmond, California, where um, you cannot open the windows where children are on some days not able to play on the playgrounds. Um, this is unconscionable. This cannot continue. And But now we have devices like the Aroma Analyzer, which with EDF's help are being brought to communities um, and they can, um, I guess the technical term might be speciate, what are the exact chemicals in the mix of volatile organics? And this is data that empowers local people who are perfectly able to speak for themselves, but we can be, um, and we should be a resource and a supporting organization that, that helps them. Um, in uh, 2021, EDF's uh, justice and equity team uh, began work on something called the Frontline Resource Institute. We, we call it free. And it's not only um, giving direct grants to community groups, but it's serving as a resource hub, connecting expertise, not only at EDF, but at other places too, um, you know, with environmental justice and frontline groups. And um, I think this is, um, something that EDF and other groups can do more of. Um, there's other groups that are doing good things. Earth, Earth Justice has been doing good work in this area for a long time. Uh, hats off to them. But, um, you know, now with IRA, we have the question of will we build all this stuff? And some people seem to think that the way that we're going to build all this stuff is by cutting communities off at the knees and not allowing them to participate in the debate. I think the way we're gonna build all this stuff is by bringing communities in early and incorporating their concerns and realizing we have to 
protect people as we decarbonize. We have to consult them early. We have to make these projects ones that benefit the local communities as well as the whole world. We can't um, just say that the the end justifies the means and, and um, the idea of building things and creating sacrifice zones is um, is unacceptable. So Fred, EDF is one of the organizations uh, among the big three, which has a chief scientist and we clearly give a lot of importance to science and depth of learning. Um, what do you think should be the way in which we approach environmental education? There have been many ideas like there should be an environmental literacy requirement, just like we have a diversity requirement now in many universities. How do you think we should operationalize environmental literacy beyond the buzzwords? And you know, the, as, as an educator myself, I feel that there is this problem of a little learning is a dangerous thing. And a lot of the popular books and all we find are very much in self-help and, and somewhat shallow. So how do we balance depth and breadth in, in educating the public? Boy, I wish I had a good answer for that, Salim, but I'm not, I don't have the expertise um, to give me confidence that I can give you a good answer. I would just say simply that um, to me as a kid um, and to this day, there's a joy in learning about um, our world, the web of life, natural systems, uh, an importance and, and an intrigue in learning about human health. And I, the only thing I can say, the only insight that I might have is we need to, you know, make it fun. EDF is going to launch a satellite called Methane Sat. It's an $88 million project. It will make um, data on what the oil and gas industry and more are, are doing from all the major oil and gas facilities. We're gonna be an eye in the sky that's gonna look at them multiple times a week. And and this will is part of a plan to inspire action to reduce these this methane pollution, which is so, so powerful. So Bill Nye, the science guy, is helping us out. Uh, you know, we are um, gonna make uh, gonna make this fun. Um, but we we need more scientist leaders. Um, when you mention EDF's grounding in science, I can't let the moment pass without saying EDF's chief scientist, Steve Hamburg, who left a tenured endowed chair at Brown to join EDF um, you know, 15 or so years ago. Uh, he is you know, an incredible scientist leader and uh, we need more of them, whether they're based at EDF or based in the academy. Just following up on on that idea of the role of science and the centrality of the data driven decision making, I'm curious uh, to get your thoughts about how you see scientists dipping their toe in the policy realm. And as the stakes get higher, as we are, as you said, in the midst of uh, an environmental ecological crisis, it becomes harder and harder for many scientists to just do the science. Uh, they're leaning into the advocacy, they're leaning into the policy, and want to be clear about communicating that to everyday people in an effective way. How do you see scientists kind of, um, kind of walking that line, essentially, and, and how do your scientists as part of EDF communicate with the public? Um, you know, this is a really important question, Lauren, and I appreciate you asking it. I, I think a lot of scientists are very committed to the science and tend to be um, very conservative about um, their predictions. I, I think one of the reasons global warming seems to be coming on faster than we thought it would it is because it is coming on faster than we thought it would. But another reason may be that some of the models kind of under predicted the events because people were wanting to be very careful, which which is appropriate. I can understand that. But at the same time, um, I think it's appropriate for scientists to, um, you know, not representing universities, but representing themselves, uh, have values and have opinions and engage in the real world with advocacy. I think there needs to be more training 
for how um, scientists can speak in in terms that laymen understand. Um, too often, you know, I will tune into uh, a Senate hearing or another venue where scientist is being questioned and it's um, it's science talk, but it doesn't relate. Even sometimes when I talk, you know, it's I revert to policy wonkism and it's it's not really understandable. So I think um, I encourage more engagement by scientists in the policy debate and attention to talking in ways that communicate. Great. Now, uh, Fred, EDF has become a global organization. And uh, as someone who comes from a developing country, Pakistan, um, I really applaud you for going beyond this impulse to be local and just focusing on uh, these issues which are inherent in planetary. Looking to COP28, you have been very engaged with, uh, in, with the United Arab Emirates government who are hosting the COP. Uh, and that has led to some controversy as well about, well, this is a country that has made its fortune through fossil fuels. How do you navigate that space in the just transition um, where, where engagement is needed, but at the same time, there is this kind of sense of we need to make a statement about the transition? Well, the um, I think there's probably is a role for people who um, want to make statements. Um, and there's a role for righteous indignation. Um, and 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 those uh, those statements and that indignation can um, you know be part of changing the world. Um, I prefer kind of righteous engagement, <laughs> righteous effectiveness. And so being able to really understand the other perspectives, the cop, by definition is supposed to rotate around the world. And so it needs to uh, be hosted in Africa as it was last year, in Europe as it was two years ago, in the Middle East as it will be this year. The Middle Eastern countries produce a lot of oil, not all of them, but many of them. So um, I think Dr. Sultan has the potential to be a breakthrough leader he, he is the CEO of a big oil company, Adnoc, but he also is, um, is the founding CEO of Mazdar, uh, one of the biggest renewable energy firms in the world. I am convinced that he understands the importance of climate change and the threat it poses to uh, the world future generations. Um, we will judge the outcome of this COP on its merits by what we see. We are working uh, very hard to support um, the UAE presidency, and um, and I hope the fact that he uh, knows the oil industry and many of its leaders um, gives him the standing to bring those oil companies along uh, in a way that we finally make the commitments on methane. Um, and other things that are doable today, this year, next year. Um, in a way that maybe other leaders couldn't. We're going to support him and what he decides to do uh, in every way we can. So turning back a little bit more to the domestic side, so you had mentioned the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act earlier, and this week President Biden proposed new tailpipe rules uh, that could push EVs to make up about two-thirds of new car sales by uh, 2032. Uh, but a recent poll also showed that roughly half of Americans are not interested in purchasing an EV for their next vehicle. But then we see from our climate communication data, including some that comes from the Yale program on climate change communication, that Americans are increasingly alarmed about climate. Why do you see there being a disconnect between the practical action that people take and also the incentives, the financial incentives that would come from the IRA? So what's the disconnect about and how do we help to push the average American towards taking a step that can really reduce their individual carbon footprint? Well, you know, electric cars aren't for everybody. Not everybody should even own a car. You live in New York City um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's not ne always necessary. But the um, I think electric cars are 
what's happening on electric cars in this country and around the world is one of the most hopeful things happening on the climate front. The fact that electric cars have gone from 1% of US sales to you know, over 7% uh, in just a few years is, is stunning. And the fact that this new rule by EDF alum, Michael Regan, head of EPA, um, is, is going to push sales exactly uh, um, as you stated to two thirds of sales by 2032. And that's going to be ramped in over time. Um, the auto industry has put up uh, announced commitments for $120 billion of new investments. It's going to create 140,000 plus new permanent jobs, not to construct the battery plants, but actually to operate the plant's ongoing jobs. Um, and I think as more people see electric cars on the road um, and trucks, the rule covered you know, trucks too, um, they're gonna realize tremendous benefits. They're not only fun to drive um, and fast, uh, but they're clean. And so in a place like New York City, where you're constantly you know, watching the UPS and the um, uh, delivery trucks, uh, FedEx go by, uh, having these be zero emitting vehicles is going to save lives and reduce children having asthma attacks. And the benefits are enormous. So I think um, there's a lot of interest and buzz around electric vehicles. I think, um, you know, people have concerns about are there charging stations? I think you know, in the last few days, 7-Eleven has said they're going to put them in their locations. You'll be able to have a Slurpee while your car is charging. I don't know what your favorite flavor might be, uh, the, but the, uh, mine is lemon lime, but the, um, the uh, Walmart has just announced they ha already have 1,300 charging stations, but they're going to build thousands more at all of the Sam's Clubs and all of the Walmarts all over America. What does this mean? 90% of Americans live within 10 minutes of either a Walmart or a Sam's Club. So the charging stations are coming. And as people see that happening, I think some of the polling attitudes you're referring to, Lauren, will, uh, will change. And right now, um, you know, there continues to be a waiting time for these vehicles. They can't, Ford can't build the 150 fast enough or the, the Mustang fast enough. So um, uh, I think this is a very hopeful thing because cars, trucks, vehicles are, you know, almost a third of the climate pollution we're putting into our atmosphere. It's the fact that not only the U.S., but the whole world is moving to cleaner vehicles. Um, yeah, I feel great about it. Just a, a follow up question uh, to that. So, you know, one of the, the challenges or the drawbacks of any kind of clean technology is still the ecological impact. So whether that's the end of the life cycle of solar panels or wind turbines and uh, electric vehicle batteries are in that space too. So as we think about the impact of uh, lithium mining uh, and then the rise of China's ability to make sodium-based batteries, where does EDF's research and policy stance uh, go in, in, in terms of electric vehicles and batteries and, and the environmental impacts of going green. Again, we can't have sacrifice zones. So, uh, and while we need, you know, new processing facilities and mines to be permitted in this country and around the world to supply these minerals, and we need research um, to come up with, you know, more ubiquitous materials that form batteries. You mentioned the sodium, sodium batteries that's been in the news. Um, we also need to make sure um, everywhere um, people are protected the people who mine are protected and um, and that needs to be incorporated into uh, all of our policies the processing plants you know have to be operated cleanly the community safeguards have to be in place and so uh, that is and will continue to be edf's position on the issue at the same time as we work to try to find ways to um, expand our ability to move in this direction, we have to protect the people who, who live nearby. Great. Well, I think uh, we're at a good point now to return to the audience for questions, uh, both online and in person. I think we'll start off with in person. 
and uh, I believe we have a mobile mic available. So please try to be specific with your questions, introduce yourselves, and uh, then go from there. Hi, Ellen Ryan, um, graduate of Yale College. Um, there's been a lot of discussion of individual uh, vehicles, but what about the effort to encourage the creation of better public transit? I mean, New York City has fantastic public transit. When you go out to Long Island, you can go from east to west and west to east. But if you want to go across, forget about it. You can't. You just can't. And I think the light rail, and plus the fact our track infrastructure is old, it's slow. So uh, what about investing in that infrastructure that would also help to mitigate these issues? Absolutely. And you know, the in the bills that were passed last year, there is the beginning of increased investment for uh, public transit. But I agree with you, the thrust of your question, Ellen, that um, not everybody needs to be in individual vehicles. I commute to work uh, on Metro North um, and um, in the subway system. So um, I'm, I'm just very aligned with what you're saying. And we there needs to be ongoing efforts to think about how to move people from here to there in the um, least emitting way and and then the investments need to be to follow yes yeah um using rail for shipping and then using more ships for shipping yeah Great. Maybe we'll alternate between online and in person. There's an uh, online question about um, Yale's uh, Office of Sustainability. Uh, Cyril May is asking uh, if you have met with the new director of the center of the office and what your thoughts are on the role of the office for Yale. Yeah, I have not yet uh, met with a new director. I look forward uh, to doing that. And um, I think the office is extremely important. It's not only how Yale operates day to day, but also um, how Yale builds and what Yale builds. Yale spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year constructing facilities and uh, rehabilitating or renovating facilities. Um, from being on the buildings and grounds committee um, at, on the corporation, I can tell you there is uh, a lot of attention being given to this. Um, and, uh, you know, the Yale Office of Sustainability will, you know, needs to uh, continue to play a very big and effective role. Um, thank you so much. My name is George Gemelis, um, Yale College in y YSC. Since graduating from YSC, I moved back to Indiana, which is a red state. And uh, it's What's come into clear focus for me is that uh, one of the big impediments to climate progress in the United States may be lack of or insufficient bipartisanship on the issue. Um, I know there's positive trend lines right now where there's more bipartisan support um, than in previous years. I know EDF has been a part of that, but it feels like we're still a ways away from making it a uh, climate the bipartisan priority it deserves to be. So I'm curious, you know, what should be done going forward to help uh, make it su such that climate is getting support from both left and right? That's a great question. Uh, I was with uh, John Curtis yesterday, who's head of the, um, who founded the uh, Conservative Climate Caucus, which has um, dozens of, you know, Republican members. Um, and um, I think that is a good effort. I, I think these issues suffer when they're not bipartisan. We need to lift them above the partisan fray. And part of that is um, finding things that we can work on together. So, you know, in the next, uh, in the current Congress, what are those opportunities? We've just passed IRA. Uh, what else can be done? IRA was the biggest thing that's ever happened on climate in any of our lifetimes by Congress. Well, one thing that can be done is the farm bill. The farm bill is up for reauthorization. How we produce our food has a huge 
footprint and farmers are impacted in really bad ways by climate chaos and the weather. And so surprisingly, maybe five years ago, I wouldn't have predicted it, but now the Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy and the Farm Bureau have many common positions on climate change. So I think they're, you know, building more bipartisanship to me is best done by finding things where there is common ground. Farm bill is one. A second one is resilience. We are being pummeled by more intense rainfall, bigger hurricanes. Um, we need to do all we can to reduce emissions of climate pollution now. And we need to recognize people are being impacted now. So we need to be smart about lifting some of our roads out of harm's way and building in um, resilience in you know, a myriad of other ways. So I, I think these are things we can work on together, not to take away from the fact that in elections, I think citizens should hold every elected official to being accountable to whether they are doing enough. To me, doing enough has to include reducing climate pollution as well as the farm bill and resilience. So we have a question uh, online asking about how important is it that uh, either the work that EDF does or the work that we see connects people with the environment and is really getting out in nature, being in the environment, feeling comfortable and confident, and also the equity and diversity issues about access to public spaces and green spaces. Uh, do you see that as a kind of precursor to being a good environmental advocate and engaging in issues? You know, I think that's really important. That there's um, um, good environmental groups that are working on that. The Trust for Public Lands comes to mind. There's an EDF alum, Diane Regas, who's the CEO of TPL. And to me, I think my experiences early on being outdoors, appreciating nature, grounded me in, um, you know, appreciating that there's a web of life and everything from protecting that web of life to human health is all connected. So I think it's extremely important. It's not what EDF is doing, but it is vitally important. Hi, thank you, Fred, for your work. My name is Laura Colmar. I'm a graduate of the Yale Divinity School, class of 83. And I know that um, faith organizations um, around the world really have one of the aspects is about social justice, social action with regard to protecting our environment. Um, and your it sounds like some of what you've done in your life has was informed partly by this understanding of um, uh, how faith might impact that. So I'm just wondering, uh, does EDF doing anything currently to interface with um, maybe the Yale Divinity School or other faith-based organizations domestically, but also abroad the World, world, um, world Council of Churches, World Health Organization, other other organizations that might be able to reach, as Celine mentioned, our children too, and making it fun and and it's a nice way, I think, and a, a good powerful way to to reach the next generation. Yes, we do have alliances with um, faith based organizations and coalitions of faith based organizations. We have found that it is um, very effective to work with them. Um, I don't have all the specifics at hand, but uh, I know we have provided funding. We have uh, lobbied together. Uh, when I was in Houston, uh, one of the people leading one of the frontline groups, um, you know, was a reverend who actually had um, given up his church to take on this cause, but brings his values and his experience and uh, probably his flock with him. So. Um, yeah, I agree with you. This is um, um, you know, protecting what we have here, life on earth is is a sacred thing. And um, it should be no surprise that many religious organizations are playing a vital role already and um, making sure we're mindful of working with them. Is, critically important. Yeah, great. Um, since we're in uh, sort of the financial hub of the world, Casey Pickett asks, what approaches to changing the global financial system to combat 
climate change do you expect to be most effective? And what opportunities do you see for people at Yale to help explore and implement those changes? Yeah, so on the first part of your question, I have a clear answer. I'm not sure I know enough um, to give a great answer on the second part, but you know, the um, investors now are interested in um, putting their money more and more investors, not all, are interested in putting their money in things that um, are part of the solution and not part of the problem. Um, and uh, the um, it's important though for investors to have actually actionable information because the general intent uh, isn't uh, that useful. Um, it's, it's good, it's prerequisite to doing things that are actionable. So at EDF um, with uh, gifts from uh, the McCants family, uh, which includes several Yale graduates, um, we have stood up something we call the Investor Insights Hub. And we are making information available to investors, uh, not only in the oil and gas sector, but in other parts of the economy like transportation and, and agriculture. Um, what should have investors know about? Um, uh, what, should, what are the questions they should be asking companies? Um, so, um, and then we are also um, standing up an accelerator to work with businesses to enable them to move faster, to share learning. Um, so that, that's a separate effort. Yale has great expertise on these subjects. So although I can't, Salim, give you a great answer, I am sure there are ways that um, Yale's professors in the SOM and, and elsewhere in the university are already um, providing important information to investors. Um, and I'm equally sure as with all things that there's more that could be done. Hi, thank you, Fred, for sharing your experiences and insights. Um, my name is Tui Fong. I'm a graduate of Yale School of Environment. And I'm currently working in the Office of Climate Change for um, well, the Global Climate Team for PepsiCo and frito Lays North America. Um, and um, my one of the things that worry me is the level of climate misinformation that is going on and how you know we, we see it's related to the bipartisan issues right we see bills in texas that are against renewables we see bills that are against uh, corporations and financial institutions acting on esg environmental social and governance so do you have some ideas of how do we solve this issue of misinformation have you seen you know initiatives that are like helping to improve this issue thank you yeah, no, it worries me about um, misinformation is a problem in our society. Everyone is their own broadcaster. Everyone can um, have their own Twitter feed. And um, some of the memes that go viral um, just are factually erroneous. And um, EDF is very much grounded in, in science and good information. We're not going to distort the truth in order to make a point. We're just going to keep to what is factual. And we have stood up an effort, I'd be happy to put you in touch with um, the folks working uh, on an effort on misinformation. One of the things we have done is work with um, other environmental groups and other knowledge centers in a coordinated way to combat misinformation on climate and, and other issues. But uh, I think it's very important to um, to combat this aggressively and proactively, and also to point out in some cases where the funding is coming from that um, uh, has an agenda to support um, misinformation. Um, and I wanna thank uh, PepsiCo and Frito-Lay Frito for your leadership on, on clean trucks, because you've not only, um, the company has not only been beginning to change its fleets, but it supported policies to get all trucks to become cleaner. And uh, I know it's not related to the misinformation question, but since you mentioned your affiliation, I just want to give a shout out to the company for its good efforts. Uh, so going back to a question online, uh, 
from Chris just asking about uh, what advice do you have for current Yale College students uh, in the Yale Student Environmental Coalition about steps uh, that undergraduates or I guess graduates as well uh, could take to encourage Yale to advance its leadership on climate and sustainability? Well, I think the Yale administration is very open um, to input and I think, um, you know, my advice would be to make the case, um, put together the case and uh, approach the administration. I know at the Yale Corporation, I'm also on the student liaison committee. So we meet with students uh, regularly uh, before each, each meeting of the corporation. And so um, dialogue is a good thing. And, uh, and there's, um, you know, marshalling the evidence and the facts to back up uh, suggested action is welcome. In general, um, what I find even from my time in, in school, um, and this is particularly true maybe of my law school experience, there are many students interested in these issues and passionate about it. And then when they get out into the world, um, they think it's just too hard to continue to work and be passionate about these issues. And um, everyone you know, needs to figure out a way to make a living. And not everyone has the luxury of um, you know, finding something to do that um, they feel great about because they have to make a living. I get that. But my advice in general to um, to folks beginning out on their career paths is be persistent. Don't give up on yourself. You don't have to work at an environmental group. You can work in for, for government, for other NGOs, in the business community. There's lots of ways to make a difference. Um, just be on the lookout for those and don't give up on finding those ways because the world needs you. The world needs everyone. This, this is an urgent Climate change in particular is an urgent challenge, and we've all got to um, participate as citizens, participate politically, and do everything we can in our lives to make a difference. Well, that's just what I was thinking of. Um, thank you for that about the uh, sense of urgency and why we can't seem to drum up more of a sense of urgency that has more of a political punch. Uh, just what's happened since the war in the Ukraine, uh, we saw the EU, which really had a much greater, it had a much greater impact on their energy prices than it did in the United States. Uh, but they didn't back down from planning on a green and low carbon future. We are here in the United States as soon as they say, oh, oh, it might cost something, you know, everyone's like, well, you know, uh, there are all these other issues that are so much more important uh, that we have to deal with right now. And um, I mean, and following this since my years at Yale in 1985, when this was all kind of coming to the forefront and seeing so little movement. And still, when you have 26 inches of rain falling in Fort Lauderdale last night, you know, and people just getting caught in their cars, I mean, it's like, what do we need to keep that, get that sense of urgency up in the American public? Well, yeah, I mean, Europe is doing good things. The European Commission just within the past few weeks has proposed a new package of laws um, to support green things. But I don't want to be lost in this, that since the war in Ukraine, the United States is doing some good things too. We talked about the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA. It's the biggest thing that's been done in our lifetimes. And it was passed after um, the war in Ukraine, um, you know, yesterday EPA proposed these regulations on electric vehicles, the most aggressive package. Um, you, you know, the biggest thing EPA has done on climate ever. Um, so I, I think, you know, there is a lot of resolve at the moment, but I don't disagree with you. We could use more. And um, I think the biggest thing that we need to hold out in our communications and in our hearts is hope. And there's a difference between optimism and hope. Uh, David Orr, uh, faculty um, at Oberlin College, taught me that 
um, you know, optimism is kind of a prediction. It's all going to be okay. Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. We have a lot of reasons to be hopeful. Um, there are these things that have been done in the United States, and now you see what Europe is doing. We may be beginning a race to the top. And that sure is a lot more hopeful than a race to the bottom. So um, the, our biggest obstacle when, when, when people feel the gloom and the doom and disengage and figure out, you know what, I might as well just have another beer or another glass of wine or whatever your favorite beverage is. And, um, but when people feel hopeful, it's worth their time and energy to engage. And when you see uh, what has happened in this country in the last few weeks, the actions the Biden administration has taken, things that are going on in the States, I think there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful, which to me means engaged. Um, there's a question I got um, from the live stream viewing that um, the U.S. and China are currently in a very difficult situation, even though the um, Biden administration had said that they would um, use the environment as a common area for cooperation. Uh, what is EDF's um, approach to this matter, having perhaps worked in China, uh, and also Yale's long-term engagement with China historically? Well, I think the uh, um, China is really important. You can't solve climate change just in the United States. It has to be solved by the whole world, and it certainly has to be solved by China, which is now the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. EDF has worked in China for almost uh, 30 years. And, um, you know, the tensions right now between um, the, our two countries are undeniable. Um, I think COVID also hurt because they've prevented travel in a way that when people aren't talking to each other face-to-face -face in person, um, tensions uh, increase. Uh, I do think, Salim, exactly as you said, that the climate issue is one that China wants to solve, they need to solve, um, and the US needs to solve. So I, I think this is a natural bridge between um, our two people, um, uh, and our two governments. And um, EDF has worked uh, in China uh, for many years. They have made big progress on cleaning up their air pollution. They have more to do, just like the U.S. has more to do. Um, but um, we've got to keep at it and increase the number of conversations happening. And the search, the creative search for what can we do that's truly in the interests of both countries? It's going to be, might sound strange, but I think it's both the competition to be the leaders in these new green technologies and the cooperation. It's going to be some mix between healthy competition and cooperation that's going to win the day. Do we have time to ask questions? Can we one my audience question? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for all the information that you've shared. Um, my name is Antoinette Wanma. I'm a graduate of um, Yale School of the Environment. And I was curious in all these discussions, what in your personal experience do you think turns someone around? Um, I know you've mentioned hope and optimism, but like what depoliticizes almost the climate and environmental issues? You know, in my experience, um, when you lecture people about the science and the gravity of the problem, um, that doesn't work. Um, people who are skeptical of climate as an issue, um, in my experience, they tend to be very patriotic Americans who love America. Now I'm speaking confined to this country. Um, they, they want the best for America, and they want American citizens to have freedoms and choices, and they see the climate issue and the environmental issue as a way to for Big Brother to restrict that freedom and choices. And I, I think um, as though those of us who want to change this and reach those people, 
need to um, communicate that there are lots of ways to solve environmental problems that increase people's freedoms, increase people's choices, increase the freedom from having an asthma attack from dirty air. In, in Florida, there's very strict rules um, that basically in function prohibit you from putting solar panels on your house in a way that makes no sense and restricts freedom. So we have, you know, at least in some states um, in the South, found common cause with folks who, you know, don't want that restriction. They want freedom. So I think the idea that those of us in the environmental movement actually care about freedom and we care about economic growth and providing jobs and livelihoods, and we can come up with answers that respect their values. Um, I've seen people's opinions change on the science like that once they believe that their own values, which I think America is great in part because we're a free society and, and we have a free enterprise system, um, communicating that, respect for that, and the fact that the solution set includes that, I think can change people's perspectives and bring them our way. So unfortunately we are at the end of our time, uh, but I'd just like to turn it back over to Craig for a moment just for some closing thoughts about what makes you excited for the future? Well, um, I'm excited, Lauren, to, to end where we began that um, uh, Yale Blue Green and the Yale School of the Environment clearly have such a dedicated um, alumni base. Um, I'm excited that more and more people, you know, want to get involved in these issues. Um, I'm excited that COP28 in the near future um, provides a new different opportunity for us to make progress worldwide. I'm excited that uh, Methane Sat is gonna launch, uh, I think next January and uh, this $88 million uh, project, um, I think is gonna bring a level of transparency and accountability to the world. Um, I'm excited that um, in the last few years, um, there are more reasons to be hopeful than ever. And if we work at it, uh, even a problem as big and daunting as climate change can be solved. Well, thank you very much, Fred. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you to everyone who is able to join us in person. Thank you to Celine for joining me this morning. And um, thank you to our friends who have joined us online. Thank you very much. Thank Fred. you. Take care.